All right, cheers, guys. Welcome to the water cooler. Cheers. Uh, <laughs> you know, th th so this past weekend, we were Chris and I got a chance to, to get together in Orlando on Friday, and uh, I got really, you know, every time I travel, it seems these days, I get sick, and I spent um, I spent all of Saturday on my couch, and, you know, if anyone's been sick on a Saturday, if you're not showing houses or holding open houses, what you find is pretty much, like, it's always like a World War II documentary, right, for, like, eight hours straight. So I got sort of I got sort of immersed in in World War II uh, uh, stories, and, and what's interesting about well, it's a lot of things that are, are obviously fascinating, inspiring about World War II. But for someone from my generation, at least, um, what was interesting about it was the complexity of, of the war, right? Uh, how many moving parts? How many different uh, players were in, in, you know involved? And and it, it, it sort of got me thinking a little bit about. It, how our businesses, right, and Chris and talking about our business here, how it kind of compares in comparison in terms of the complexity uh, that's involved and obviously the stakes that, that, that we're, uh, we're, we're battling at right now. But one thing that was interesting that came from that discussion and it really was, I think, the inspiration for, for at least my thoughts going into tonight's show is we talk about this a lot in the water cooler. Uh, we give you tactics on how to grow your business, tactics on uh, what are the best uh, lead generation strategies, lead conversion strategies? We have entrepreneurs and authors on the show, uh, uh, you know, in the past. One thing that we don't talk about is if all the things that we do lead to success, right? How do you manage that success? Mm -hmm. How do you kind of take it one step further, where you're not that person who is a slave to their business, who feels like things are sort of falling completely out of control, right? Like the, the wheels are falling off the bus. And that's something that isn't talked enough about, and we're lucky and blessed, uh, Chris and I, and obviously our, our guest tonight, Jay, to, to be in a position where Jay's ten times the success of Chris and I. I don't want to put us in the same, in the same ballpark here, but um, you know, we're lucky to kind of be in a position where we've hit a certain level of success, and now that becomes a focal point, at least for us in our business. So we're going to dive deep into the topic of obviously the one thing, but I think the larger idea, it's part of that kind of discussion is this idea of once you achieve success, how do you break through plateaus, how do you manage it, how do you balance that work-life balance, and uh, it's going to be a fun discussion. So we got a lot of things to dive into, but Chris, I want you for our audience who doesn't know who Jay is, uh, never read the book, uh, just give a brief kind of introduction because obviously he's got a, a, a great uh, resume here and want to share that with the audience. Yeah, one of the cool things about the show, Jimmy, is that we get a chance to talk with, with people like Jay from Keller Williams, mm -hmm. who, you know, probably doesn't uh, speak at a lot of REMAX events, as an example, you know? And, you know, <laughs> like, you know, there's agents that watch our show across brands. So that's one thing I'm always really excited about, which is that you and I follow Jay. We've read the book. We keep in touch with him. We see him at the KW events. But a lot of our audience tonight, Jay, probably... Uh, you know, they would need a little bit of an introduction just because, you know, they're with a different company or they're in a different industry. Some of the people watching are technology people. So I've known Jay for a few years, but his latest book is The One Thing, which has been an international bestseller, 250,000 copies in circulation. And just to keep that in perspective, Jimmy, uh, that's like 8,000 <laughs> times more than uh, Austin and I. But, you know, the, the idea is that, like, it, it, realistically, 10,000 copies of a business book, you could mm -hmm. almost say is a bestseller. You know, 20, 30, 40,000, like Gary Vaynerchuk's book in the, in the first uh, week had something like 27,000. 250,000 is rare air in the publishing world. This is like Sheryl Sandberg, Lean In, and yeah. Jay and Gary you know, with the one thing. It really is unprecedented. So the lessons from the book are going to be huge, but then just the lesson of the book. How do you go from what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Jimmy, whiteboard to scoreboard? You know, there's yeah. meetings that take place. Jay has a, uh, a more eloquent way to say it than I just did, but awesome interview. If everybody watching on Twitter and Facebook, if you're on Twitter especially, use the hashtag watercooler pound water cooler and share the link right now you guys it's gonna be an insightful interview curator.com forward slash papasan p-a-p-a-s-a-n and we're gonna get going here Jimmy I'll let you so, so Jay where, where I want to start the conversation on and off it and first welcome to the show um I want to talk about sort of the behind the scenes of, of making the book right uh, and, and what what sort of in, first what inspired you guys to, to write the book but why do you think that right now 
especially in the digital age of 2013, 2014, why do you think right now it just sort of, as soon as it hit the shelves, it caught fire, right? What was that, what was that sort of, I guess, inspiration and, and just, I guess, a bit of the backstory behind that? You know, it's a, it's a universal feeling right now. I think a lot of folks feel overloaded, right? We've got too much on our plates, especially in this industry. You know, your to-do lists run three or four pages. Your yeah. calendars are overbooked. Um, and you end up, instead of feeling like you have all this opportunity, you end up feeling like you've got, it's almost oppressive. And I think that when we wrote the book, it actually came out of an essay. Gary went home, we were working on a course, it was over five years ago, mm -hmm. and he wrote a little essay called The Power of One. And it was about lead generation, right? Because the one thing in our industry that you never give up is, you know, you're always lead generating. Yep. And he made that point really eloquently. And as a someone who's I've been in publishing for 20 years now, I was like, wow, this is this is your good to great. You know, Gary's good at a lot of stuff, but I think the thing that distinguishes him, it's not that he's you know this giant intellect. He's really smart and he works hard, but he doesn't work a lot longer than anyone else. The thing he did better than anyone else is he identified the priority, and he was willing to stick to it. And mm -hmm. when you do that, you don't have to do all the other junk. And yeah. it resonated. And when we tell people, you know, would it be a good thing for you if we told you how to do a lot less and get a lot more? And they're like, of course, tell me how. <laughs> and it's a simple concept, but as we'll talk about, it, it's challenging to implement and to make it a habit, right? And, because and, the world doesn't work with it. Well, and one thing I would say is it almost felt like a reverb to the digital revolution that we call it, which was you know, over a course of like five or six years there, whether it was an app or a social networking site or some type of lead generation strategy or some kind of Ben Kenny course, right? You know, <laughs> there, there, was, there was something and it almost felt like, you know, people were very digitally distracted. And I got a chance to interview Gary kind of, I think, pre, pre the one thing coming out. And the line mm -hmm. that I'll never forget is he said, I, wanna give, I wanted to give people a lease to do less. And, uh, yeah. and, and I think if people watching tonight take one thing away, it would be give yourself a lease to do less and you'll end up doing everything you do better. And, and that's kind of the general premise for people that aren't familiar with the one thing is, you know, you can only do one thing at a time, right? Like right. you can have 3000 apps, but you can't use them all. You can, you know, only be in one conversation a lot of times at, at a time. And, so I think uh, the, the need for people to focus was at an all-time high. Is that fair to say, Jay? Absolutely. I mean, the word multitasking is something that came out of the computer age, right? They looked at a computer that was about a 1,000 times slower than your iPhone, and it was doing things so fast, they thought, surely it's doing two things at once. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a lie. I mean, it's actually switch tasking. It, it was going back and forth, back and forth so fast, it looked like it was doing two things at once. But our brains don't work that way. But this whole concept came out there. And the thing that blew me away is we actually talked to a social scientist mm -hmm. and the whole idea of work-life balance. That's mm -hmm. a brand new idea. It did not show up as a phrase. We did a LexisNexis search of all the magazines and newspapers until 1980s. And what the researchers said is sometime in the 70s, you saw women go into the workforce in, in, in mass. And we used to have this kind of quaint concept of a breadwinner and a homemaker. And all of a sudden you have two bread makers by necessity. Now who's taking care of the house? Well, in the beginning, mom got stuck with that job too. And so for about a decade, and it was really small, like 36 mentions in the first year, people were saying, I'm out of balance. I have no work-life balance. And then you watch that and it ramps up, man. It goes crazy in the 90s and now everybody's saying it. And then in the year 2000, it exploded. What device showed up in our worlds in the year 2000? Yeah. Well, the internet. Remember? Well, the device. It was the, the internet. Device. Well, but the, but the cell phone really, I think, became a big part. It became really uh, mainstream at that point. You nailed it. It was the BlackBerry. All of a sudden, you could get your work email anywhere you were. Mm -hmm. You know, I can remember going and firing up the modem, and then you'd fire up the computer. It took you five minutes to go to work at home, mm -hmm. and that was fast. Yeah. And all of a sudden, everywhere you went, your boss could reach you. And then in 2007 was the height of this idea. That's when the iPhone came out. 
it seems like that was forever ago, but it was just 2007, and that's where this whole idea of where am I supposed to be? You know, this this craziness. I don't think we were ready yet for technology to break down all the barriers. It was really nice to leave the office, but mm -hmm. now the office can follow us everywhere, and it is yeah. a benefit. Look at us. You're drinking wine and talking at your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, and Jimmy's in Boston, and I'm in Orlando, and you're in Austin. So there's there's yeah. good things that come out of it come out of it as well. I mean. Jimmy, what do you have to add there? You look like you want to well, add. well, there's a lot of things that are kind of coming to mind as, as we're talking about this. Because one thing that I, I struggle with, and I want to get your guys' reaction to this, is that I feel so. Jay, what you're talking about, this is fascinating. This idea that work-life balance is. Well, real, real quick, real quick story, Jimmy. So I was at Quicken Loans when the Blackberries became kind of like pr pretty mainstream, mm -hmm. and I remember they came to the bankers, and we had always basically been like tied to the desk, right? Like. You know, we had to sit down and log into the CRM and dial from the phone at the desk. And it was such a bait and switch because it was like, hey, see this awesome phone that's way better than your phone? And it's like, yeah. And they're like, well, we'll give you one of those for free and we'll pay for your data. And the only catch is you have to hook it up to your work email. And now we expect you to be on the clock all the time. You know, that was kind of <laughs> how the conversation went. But it, I wrote an article a couple years back called uh, The End of OOO. Right, like they're, they're, the office doesn't exist anymore. So I think tackling that, what I was going to try to give a little quip there, Jimmy, would be that work-life balance requires airplane mode because that is the device that fractured uh, the concept of you know eye to eye, belly to belly. Anyway. Well, let, let, it, 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 let's take a step back here because we're we're getting into kind of time management, work-life balance. But but I want to I want to do some sort of diagnosis here, right? Uh, of, you touch on it a little bit briefly, Jay, about uh, you know we we're distracted, but beyond distraction, right? What are some of the challenges that you find that agents are facing right now that's kind of preventing them from going to that next level, right? So they they're buried by Facebook and their email, but there's, there's, there feels like there's something else. Either they're not asking the right questions, not setting the right goals. What are your what are your thoughts there that's sort of not getting us to that next level that all of us are sort of achieving or striving for? Um, there's a lot of culprits. In the beginning, I think people do what's comfortable, and so they're on Facebook, mm -hmm. and they are networking with their clients, but they haven't decided whether that's the most effective thing to do or not. And if you're really committed to success, you're willing to cross that line from comfort to discomfort and do things that you're uncomfortable. And I'm not saying there's nothing bad about Facebook. Like I use it, I use it to market my business, but face-to-face, -face, belly to belly, direct communication on the phone, those are richer forms of lead generation in the sense that you get really great feedback on the market, right, from them, all those things. And that's just an example of people, we called it the okay plateau in the book. They get to a place where they're doing just kind of okay. Mm -hmm. and they just got out of maybe a big discomfort, but to go through the next level, they have to get uncomfortable again. And a misconception we have about success is we look at people like Gary Keller and we imagine that his life is all calm and beautiful. But to get there, you've got to constantly be willing to go through that cycle again and again, and the cycle gets bigger. You know, each little level throws you more out of balance, and you have to have a bigger model to adapt. And I think that it's a big part of it. It's like that comfort. You get comfortable, and then things feel okay, and then you stop pressing. Well, how do you find sort of true north when you're going through that discomfort phase, right? Because I think one thing that is is challenging is like, okay, if we tell people right now, if you're comfortable, you're okay with your business, and you're sort of and you feel like you want to get to that next level, you've got to get out of your comfort zone. But how do you sort of identify you're going in the completely wrong direction, right? You get out of your comfort zone, like you find different things, and like because like, you because you talk a lot about this idea of progression, right, and that results kind of, and we'll, have, we'll talk about this, this concept in a little bit here, but like how do you, how do you sort of find that, that compass or that true north when you're in that, that phase, if you will? Well, I just actually taught a workshop on this in San Francisco, and one of the concepts we teach in the book, and this is pretty far back, so if you don't finish it, you don't get there, it's called goal setting to the now. And so when you think about what you actually want to accomplish in your business or your marriage or your workout routine, the way really successful people do is they go way out, like beyond five years, and they say, what does it look like? And they get pretty clear on it. Mm -hmm. And then they start working backwards. They'll say, well, where would I have to be in five years to feel like I was on pace for my version of the real estate empire, right? I want to be Ben Kinney someday, or I want to have an amazing show like you guys, whatever. 
It doesn't happen overnight. It happens way out there. You work backwards, and then you say, well, in a year, what would I have to accomplish to feel like I was on track to five years? And then you come to the year, and you don't keep looking at that distant goal. It's like us aiming at the moon. How do we really know how to get there? Mm -hmm. But we might know how to get to that next landmark. And I had to sit there and ask Gary questions for like a day, going, tell me how you came up with that answer. Mm -hmm. And it's working backwards. Now, most of us were ambitious, maybe a little ADD and creative. And there's this thing. We almost wrote about it. It didn't make it in the book. We were going to talk about the low-hanging fruit, right? It could be called the shiny object at a, at a different you know, conference, right? Mm -hmm. But we see something that promises quick results, and we go rushing after it. And the problem with that is you might get a payday, but it might be in the exact wrong direction from where you're supposed to be headed. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. It's like I'm driving to Fargo, which is due north from here, but the nearest gas station is 30 miles down the road. So I go that way because I need a gas. Well, now I'm 60 miles away from my goal, but unless I'm paying attention, I don't notice it. And I, I blame the low-hanging fruit. You know, yeah. You're looking up, you go, wow, opportunity, and you rush off over there, but you forgot to look at your map first. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one of the and, things that people use as a map, Jay, is a to-do list, and one of the biggest takeaways for me from the, reading the one thing was the to-don't list. And that, you're, that if you'll take basically this kind of 80-20 rule that's well, right. well established that you guys talk about and apply that to the traditional to-do list, talk a little bit about that, like kind of just fl what most people call flipping the funnel, you know, a to-don't list versus a to-do list. It shows up all over. I remember the first time I read the four-hour work week, he just said, when you go to work, know the number, the three things that you absolutely positively have to get done and do those first. Mm -hmm. And our theory is when you look at the 20 things that you know you've got to do, stop, right? right? Ask what is the priority among all of these things. The question in the book is what's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything would be easier or unnecessary. And in our experience, and we've been coaching to this book for now almost six years, people almost always know the answer if they'll just stop and look at their list and go, I really got to start there. Mm -hmm. I, because Facebook's open or something else is open, they go jump on those other things. So I have a colleague, his name is Les. Every day when he came into the office, he did this for almost three months before he figured it out. He just looked at his to-do list and he gave five minutes. He set a timer. He only gave himself five minutes so he wouldn't overanalyze it, and he tried to come up with his top five things to do that day. And he promised himself he would start with number one. And that guy, he's actually left our company and started his own business now. So I think it was working for him. I'm sorry to lose him, but I watched <laughs> him very humbly take his to-do list and just, we call it turning it into a success list. What's mm -hmm. number one? What's number two? And start knocking him out in that order. You find out if you do the top three, you feel really righteous. You go have a giant cheeseburger at lunch, and you don't do the rest. And you don't you know, have to. You know, Jay, I'm listening to this book right now. Uh, it's called The Four Disciplines of Execution. And one of the concepts they talk about is the whirlwind, right? And what, yeah. you, what you just talked about sounds like a pretty pretty straightforward answer to the question of how do you deal with the whirlwind, which is, for those of you who, who haven't read the book or don't understand the concept, is basically what you do every day. You get in and... Like we talked about in the show in the past, Chris. Uh, like your emails and the calls that are coming in is someone else's to-do list, right? It's not yours. It's someone else's to-do list. So what you're talking about there, this idea of prioritizing uh, the success list, if you will, want to call it, and kind of banging those things out first and foremost, makes a lot of sense. We had Tim Smith on the show a couple weeks ago, and he he kind of uh, made the analogy of eating your olives and pickles. And what he was saying was doing the things first that you know you're supposed to do. But, you know, before you get sucked into that, that whole thing. And, and Jimmy, you can even think about it a little bit more simply. The things that make you money, you know, a lot, that's how a lot of people approach this principle is what are the income-producing activities? Gary would say that's talking on the phone yeah. to, to people, right? So one of the uh, – I did a video on this a while back, but it was like how do you implement the, the one thing or the four-hour work week into kind of a, a, an app, and I use an app called AnyDo. I'm sure you've mm -hmm. probably looked at a ton, but I've now kind of swiped off, like you're saying, one at a time in a priority list uh, almost 900 times now. I'm an AnyDo power user, 
And so I think that it's, it's a two-step strategy. Establish what makes you money the next day that you have to do. Wake up and hyper-focus on that. And to your point of the cheeseburger, the cheeseburger could be spending time on Twitter and Instagram as well, yeah. right? The cheeseburger can be fitness. The cheeseburger can be some of these other things that people strive to do. So anyway, and one other thing from the book I don't want to miss, Jimmy, real quick. Yeah, sure. There's, there's, I've always heard that it takes 22 or 21 days if you want to build that habit. So if you're trying to establish using a to-do list or if you're trying to get better at prioritizing what's important in your business and in your life, it takes three weeks or four weeks or you know, kind of like a stint in rehab, if you will, right? Like 30 days or whatever. But you, your research says otherwise. Talk a little bit about that, Jay. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, the, there's a group in 2009 at the College of New London, and they got a group of almost 200 grad students to take on a new health habit. And they were looking for when does something become habitual. And they let the kids choose anything. Like some kids, like their health habit was drinking eight glasses of water, right? Seems relatively easy. There were people who were going to run every day. We looked at the list, and there were people like who were quitting smoking, you know, like really hard stuff, like breaking habits. Mm -hmm. And then all they did for a year was following them around. They used, you know, I think it was a pager, and they had to answer two questions. Did you do it, yes or no? And how hard was it? And what they were looking for was this point where they got 95% through the effort because it never goes to zero. Like even brushing your teeth, I mean, God forbid you forgot to brush your teeth today, but there's this little tiny ounce of energy it takes to remember to go in there and do it because I know I've ended up in the driveway and gone, oh, crap, and run back in the house, right? So even the most established habit still requires something from you, but where does it get as easy as it's pretty much going to get? And they found on average it took 66 days. So it's almost three times, more than three times as long as most people thought. And we actually looked at the data, because I'm a little wary of throwing a number out there now. Mm -hmm. Like We have a 66-day challenge, but the idea is do it until it becomes habitual. Mm -hmm. Because some people it happened in 18 days, but some people it took 254. So there's a lady that works here. Her name's Veronica. I won't say her last name. She used that idea to quit smoking. And I remember she, she had this calendar, and she was Xing off her days, and she got to the last day. <coughs> she came in and said, I did it, 66 days. And I'm a reformed smoker. I mean, I was like rolling them drum. I was hardcore. <laughs> and I was like, I was doubtful that she had kicked the habit. And I just asked her, I said, does it feel easy now? And she goes, no, it's still a struggle every day. I said, why don't you do another 66 days? And she just looked, I felt bad. She looked crestfallen. Mm -hmm. And I was like, she goes, but you know what? You're right. I'll keep going. She came to me, and about 120 days, like almost all the way through the cycle again, she goes, it happened. I, what happened? She goes, I, d I don't think about cigarettes anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, congratulations. That's what it feels like, right? You know, it's like when you're trying to get up and get used to waking up early, and you start waking up just before the alarm clock goes off. You've trained your body to do something, so you don't have to work for it anymore. Yeah. You so know, I, I love think, that. I, I think the reason people look at that shorter time frame is because it's more attractive, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. it, it, you know, we, we want to believe that we can form a habit, but I think my takeaway there is stop being delusional. Yeah. You know, you, you didn't form your bad habit in 20 days. How are you going to get rid of it in 20 days? You know, and I think that, like, even right now, I've been trying to walk and trying to get on a little bit of a health kick and stuff, and it's like, you know, everybody wants to lose 10 pounds in the first week. And if your goal instead was to lose 18 pounds in the first six months, a lot more people would hit their goal. So I think yeah. we, because of this, back to your earlier point, Jimmy, trying to make it come full circle, because of this digital technology, because of this device in our hand, because of all of these distractions, we, we, we've, we've kind of, we kind of are hoping and wishing that adoption happens instantly. And that's just not the case. I mean, you know, working with Keller Williams on, on things like Dot Loop and rolling out technology like that, you, you would be crazy to say, hey, come to this one training and you're good to go. You know, or, hey, come, if you want to get off Outlook, Chris and Jimmy are going to do a class and you're done. You're golden. That's just crazy <laughs> thinking. Like Austin talks about that in people work where, the, the, the actual time it takes to decide to quit using Internet Explorer is one second. But the number of times we go back to what's comfortable 
can sometimes become infinite. So it's not a decision to change, it's actually changing. And actually changing takes more of a time commitment than I think most people are putting on their calendar. So good for you guys for almost like Mythbusters. That's what I was thinking. I was going to think of. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's talk about depression here for a second, guys. Uh, because I think that one thing that we all... Depression? Probably, Is that what you said? Yes, depress. Well, dep like th this depressing realization that when you when like a a a every time we have an interview like this, right? You get fi like people our audience will get fired up. They they're going to wake up tomorrow at five a.m. They're going to pump iron. They're going to write their success list, and they're going to kill it on day one, right? And they may do that for day two, you know, day seven, day twenty-one. But then there's a there's a, there's a setback, right? This, this always happens at some point, and when the goals are far out, right? Five years. Bezos and Chris, what's the guy from Evernote? What's his name? Um, the CEO. Phil there. Levin. Yeah, they got like a hundred-year yeah. business plan. It's a, it's kind of this common, I, I guess, trait we're seeing with successful entrepreneurs. They have this long-term vision. But mm -hmm. when you have, can, like, can I can I interject, Jimmy? Sure. I, I read that the guy who founded Guinness, when he signed the lease, he signed a nine-thousand-year lease. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me for a beer like Guinness. Uh, yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite beers. Um. Well, but that's that, but that's kind of that I want to post to you, which is dealing with setbacks, mm -hmm. dealing with the fact that you're not going to climb to the top of Everest in 21 days or 66 days or whatever it is. How do you have that mindset where you can celebrate those those small wins, if you will? Um, I think awareness. I think that um, the Seinfeld story. He talked about don't break the chain. This guy ran into Seinfeld, and it's a story about habits. And the guy goes up to him at an open mic and says, so I want to be a great comedian. What do I do? Seinfeld says, well, the one thing is to write a joke every day. But what I loved about it, he goes, and here's how. I want you to get one of those giant wall calendars that has every day of the year. You know, like the stuff you get from a bank that's all laminated like a poster. Yeah. And he goes, and then get a red grease pencil. And every day you write a joke, I want you to put a big red X on it. And what happens then is you start to see your progress. And he goes, after a little while, your, jo your job every day isn't to write a joke, it's to not break the chain. So you wake up, you travel or whatever, and you get that horrible cold and watch World War II videos all day long. <laughs> and instead of writing your joke, but then you look up at your calendar and you see, you've, oh man, I've got, I got 78 straight days. I can't let that go to waste. Mm -hmm. And the problem with so many of our white collar pursuits is that our progress is intangible. I mean, I write books. I can count words, but I don't know if I'm any closer to a finished book. I might have to rewrite it ten times. Mm -hmm. But get attached to doing the activity, and the reward comes from the joy you feel of sticking to it. There's, there's, a, a, there's an oh, amazing sorry. book called Mastery by George Leonard, and it's like an old book. And this guy, like, went to become a master in Aikido. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how he thought it was going to be so boring because they don't get to learn new stuff. They just keep doing the same things better. Mm -hmm. He goes, I got so in tune with the little minutia. And he goes, I never thought I would see the granularity of a punch or whatever it is they do in Aikido, right? I just think of Steven Seagal with his little ponytail, <laughs> right? And you've got this art, but he goes, you just get more and more refined in how you view it, and you start to take great joy in the tiny victories. Mm -hmm. So I think people have to stick with it just long enough Right, like running, till you finally get your runner's high. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen the first time you run. You feel like you're breaking ribs and you want to die. But you do it long enough, and all of a sudden, people start to get addicted to it. And so there is that, that, that no man's land, let's call it, mm -hmm. that you have to travel through. But there's this real rich reward. So I'm a big advocate for little rewards. Like every day is a victory, honestly. That's that yeah. red X. There's a, there's a, Make it a victory. Celebrate. There's a new app on the, just on the theme of, of health and fitness and apps and, and stuff like that. There's a, there's a new app where you, it's seven minutes a day for seven months. That's the ah. work. It's a workout you know, app, right? And what I thought was, yeah. really cool, was really cool was like if you don't use the app, for two straight days, so if you break the chain, they will erase all of your data that you've <laughs> earned up to that point. So, like, you know, I have different apps. I know people use Fitbit and people use Fuel Band. Yeah. So it's kind of that idea of, like, liter a literal, you know, don't break the <laughs> chain. 
if you don't work out two days in a row, you get a push notification and they let you know that all your data is now gone and you have to start back at the beginning. Um, so be accountable, but really accountability, yeah. Well, uh, so, so where I want to go, guys, is, is um, you know, I, I saw Tim Cook on, on, Char on Charlie Rose recently, and one of the things that Tim Cook said during that interview, which, which I thought was great, was since we don't say no to a lot of good ideas, we say no to great ideas, right? Yeah. And this idea that, you know, Apple is, is, is famous for their ability to focus as a company. Um, and it, as a result, their focus has created, it's probably their competitive advantage, real, realistically, when you sort of zoom the lens out a little bit. So, so talk to us, Jay, a little bit about saying no, because I think this is something that you, you talked about a little bit, the low-hanging fruit, but what traps do you find agents kind of fall? Like, how do you, how do you balance doing the uncomfortable or the things that give you that discomfort and still saying no? Because they, they seem to be sort of, they're pulling in different directions, right? Well, first I want to address the irony of, of putting Apple on a pedestal on a Google platform. Um, but <laughs> yes, let's talk about saying no. And also how to say yes. Um, I think that when you're really clear what you're saying yes to and you understand the commitment to really do it well, it gets easier to say no to things. But a lot of people never make it through that first venture. Um, we found an interview, and it's, a, it's, a, it's on YouTube, and it's like Stephen Jobs, 1997 or 98. Mm -hmm. He's fresh back from his exile. And at that time, I think they had 250-something products. Mm -hmm. Within two years, he had narrowed it down to like 14. Remember when they had printers and stuff? Like everything. They'd throw an apple on anything. Yeah. And then he narrowed it down, and it was within a year of that that they came out with the iMac. And that started the whole parade of it's one thing, then one thing. And so first off, if you're able to say no, it's the biggest gift in the world. Uh, because now you're able to say no to stuff because you're saying yes to something. Mm -hmm. And I find when I talk to people, all right, it's hard to lead generate every day. Whatever you do, whether it's pick up the phone or knock on doors or prospect on the internet, whatever it is you do to get your leads, that's your number one thing, it's hard to do that day in and day out. Yeah. Why are you doing it? Why do you want to be successful other than mom's proud? And then what would happen if you don't achieve it? And most people haven't thought enough about it to have any consequences attached. Now this is a listing question. So Jimmy, why do you want to move? Tommy needs to be in a new neighborhood. Great. Mm -hmm. you need to move? Well, school starts in four and a half months. We're in a rush. Great. How much do you think your house is worth? The sanity question. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth question is, what will happen if you don't move? If they say, oh, well, we'll do it next year. Are they motivated? No. Yeah. yeah. If they say, oh, well, Tommy loses his scholarship, and he's going to end up in you know this horrible school where there's all this violence. Well, now they're motivated. Mm -hmm. So if you could take a couple of minutes, and we call this figuring out your purpose, which is heavy, but why the heck are you working so hard? Uh -huh. you know, what's important about it for you, and what happens if you don't do it? And you talked about depressing earlier. Like when I'm, I'm real clear about mine. On my goal sheet, I wrote down that thing. And when I think about failing that thing, it's got nothing to do with bestsellers. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with money. It really makes me... It, I, I, I get, I get emotional. I can't talk about it. And that's how I know it's real for me. And the moment it doesn't become real, it won't be a motivation anymore. So that to me is like the vision to say yes has got to be coming from really deep inside of you because that gives you that amazing ability to say no to everything else. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's actually, I, I think, really insightful, Jay, for, at least from, as I'm listening to this, I, I think this idea of taking the time to define why you're doing the things you're doing versus deciding on saying no to certain things is actually an interesting way of phrasing it because yeah. I, I, do, I do think that we don't do enough, and Chris, you could talk about this a little bit, but uh, reflection of our business, right? We talk about this a lot, you know, and, and especially when you're, when you're it's, and this is like, it's, it's hard for sometimes agents who are watching the show to relate to this because they, they may be a one-man show. So if you've got right. a staff, right, you've got people supporting you, uh, it, it's easy to say, well, you know, I can reflect on the business because I have, other people doing that that daily work. Um, but and, and, re and really quickly on that note, Jimmy, I want people to go to the one thing dot com slash water cooler. We're giving a great offer tonight. But w when you go to the one things website and you look at the 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 
enormity of what the project's become, please believe there's an amazing team working alongside Jay. You know, people, some of the people that I know, a lot of people that I don't know. So I think that's one of the one of the keys here, Jimmy, is you know, we talk about this week after week, right? We always say, like, if you're the single agent out there and you don't have this, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Isn't the answer just get that? You know, like Ben <laughs> Kenny said, live in the who. You don't have a product problem. You have a people problem. And so, you know, the one thing is probably as successful because of Gary as it is, because of Jay as it is, because of the team that people don't know their names, that – uh, yeah. worked on the website, worked on the podcast, set up the shopping cart. And by the way, Jimmy, cure, uh, the one thing.com, T H E, the number one thing.com, slash water cooler. Awesome deal tonight for anybody watching. Anybody on the recording will honor this as well. Hard copy of the one thing, and we'll throw in a hard copy of people work. And that's going to be $15 total, including shipping. Shipping's included there. So you go to the, the number one thing dot com forward slash water cooler, buy the book, send me your receipt, chris at curator dot com, and you'll get the one thing and people work. You know, Jay, I'm always honored when I'm on Amazon and I'm looking at y'all's reviews. You know, there's so many there now, like 400 something reviews. And I and I always see and I always feel great at the bottom when it says frequently bought together and people works down there next to the one thing. So I think that's because you're um, logging, Chris, because Amazon's really like smart about these things. They like know that you're the author or something. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I always recommend your book at the bottom. No, uh, but but anyway, I want a lot of people to buy the book. If you yeah. buy the book, we'll give you two books for fifteen bucks, including shipping. T H E the number one thing dot com slash water cooler. That way we know that you bought the book tonight. And honestly, Jimmy, it's it's like a it's a top five book period in the last twelve months. It really became you know it tr- millionaire real estate agent for people that have never read that book. Talking about c- people outside of the Keller Williams system getting a chance to tune in. Yeah. If you've never read that, you need to do yourself a favor and do that as well. I mean, just saying. Yeah. And we'll, and we'll definitely plug that too. <coughs> I know Sharing we, that, I wanted to piggyback on what you said about living the who, because you're right. If something's missing from your life, something big is missing, you're probably missing your relationship. Gary says that probably 10 times a week. And it's true, because when you look at how he's done, like at this point, we have Keller Williams, we have a private equity firm that we're running, we have, I've got a real estate team, he's got offices. He's got, you know, uh, you know, this whole other businesses. And how he does that is he's always looking for the right person to work through, and that's their one thing. And on a team, it's the same way. You know, the first person we hired was an admin for my wife's team. And that person took on all the, the contract clothes. And then we had someone who helped us with, you know, the, the, the database. And then we brought someone in to show houses. And then we brought someone in to help buyers. And you bring in these specialists in our industry, and it's, it is the next level. It's how you go from, from I do it to we do it, and eventually, a real business person, it's they do it. And that's the ultimate handoff. That's freedom. But you have to master that, how do I get in a relationship with talent and help them see that their dreams can come through my business too. I can make it all happen if we do it together. Mm-hmm. That, that's a perfect segue to, to and I mean, we got only about five minutes here, Jay, and this is where I want to end okay. the show with you because we won't keep you too long. You know, you're a busy guy, and we know you work at like 5 a.m., so it's going to be late there on uh, the Central Time Zone. Um, managing a team. Uh, as, as, a, as a leader of an organization, albeit a three person team or a 20 person team, right, we talk a lot about delegation, right? So you, if I'm that person, I buy into this concept of the one thing. Right, I clear all the crap off my schedule that doesn't help me achieve the one thing, my goal is going to help everything else become easier. But then what's left is I have a sense of clarity and purpose, but the people who support me, right, they're still kind of caught in the trenches. And Adi Williams, uh, we have posted this group, uh, question on Facebook, and Adi Williams asked this question. She feels really comfortable. She's really inspired. She kind of had that aha moment. Now she wants to know how can she translate that to not just herself as a leader, but every everybody who surrounds her that's part of the team. 
you know, great businesses have a why too. You know, like Southwest Airlines became the low cost airlines and that helped everybody from the top to the bottom make decisions in the absence of getting permission. You know, that's how we got herded onto planes. That's why we don't have a lot of food. You know, all those things came from that little decision, like what are we all about? What's going to distinguish our company? And great real estate companies do the same thing. You know, the leader communicates the vision, right? You can't get buy-in in the sense that you're not twisting their arms, right? It needs to be something. You've recruited people that were aiming in that same direction anyway. And so you get people who share the vision. There's a win for them. Like we're big advocates for even on an agent business, you profit share. Hey, guys, when we hit this level, we all win. Mm -hmm. And now everybody's aiming there because for them, you know, you might be the owner thinking, great, I get to hire my next help. Or they're thinking, great, I get to buy a plane ticket home for Christmas, whatever that is. But now we're all moving in this together. And I think that it can't just happen once. It's not a banner you put on the wall. Mm -hmm. I think you can put it on the wall, but then you got to talk about it every day. You know, I meet with my team almost every day. We have a stand up. Every week I meet with them individually and we review how are you doing Your goals are lined up with our goals. And I think when people know that someone's checking in, they always want to make progress. That's what we call accountability. So I think just relentlessly communicating. I can only work, imagine working with Allison, like with people work. I'm sure that people got so sick of hearing that word, if that's part of his vision for how he's building his company. I see great leaders do that all the time. Yeah, well, the, the, that's something I actually don't think, and because uh, actually this this is a good gut check test. I was actually thinking about this today, which is for us, Chris. If we said to you know our our goal as a company, right? We discussed this, Chris, myself, and Andrew, our founder, discussed like what's our goal of the company two years from now, five years from now. If we asked our team that, they probably wouldn't be able to answer that question. Right? They're really good at their job. They're working kind of in a silo, but they probably couldn't answer that question. And if we got the answer, probably different for each person. And I think it's a really good gut check test. I'm sorry? It's like the newlyweds game, right? You work together, you know each other so well, but you don't know what each other's favorite food is. Yeah, that's, that, and, that's, and, that, and I think that's, that's where if, you, if you're wondering right now and you're watching the show, is my vision clearly articulated? Do I have that, that everyone's on the same page, everyone's marching in the same direction? Well, ask them, right? Don't lead the question, what's the vision of the company? And if they can't answer it or everyone's giving you different answers, then you're the problem. Your, vi your, your ability to sort of share that vision is a, is a problem. Uh, so, yeah, this is something I, I think right now, especially with the ability, Chris, right now for us to find help really easily through Elance or Odesk or all these services where we can, where talent, it's become really flat, right? We don't have to find someone locally. We can find talent worldwide. Uh, managing talent is now becoming a really, really big challenge for any growing real estate company. Yeah, I, tell I you think like a, a secret, real quick, yeah. it's 90 days. Think of it like a 66-day challenge for your new hire, whether it's a contractor or not. The two or three things that they have to do to be successful most job descriptions like and must lift 20 pounds and all the other crap. What are the three or four activities, right? Mm -hmm. I need you to show homes. I need you to know your scripts and I need you to be able to renegotiate contracts. Do you know how to do those things? Yes or no. If it's no, well, let's train you and as fast as possible, get them into action so that they're, you can see that they're doing it the way that you want. Most people can't fake it for 90 days if they don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. So as fast as you can, Get them doing it the curator way, the, the water cooler way, and then watch it. And for 90 days, be a control freak. And if they're still performing, you can kind of back off, but you've conditioned them a little bit to this idea that they're you know, being watched, and then, then you're just checking in. You're coaching. But most people aren't willing. They think that the moment they hire someone, it's the victory lap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it actually, is, it's not honeymoon. You're just dating. You're going to get married at the end of 90 days or 100 days. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it. We <laughs> and Jimmy, what's great? What's great about like share? What we're really saying here: share the bigger vision, share the finish line, share the purpose. There's a great quote from JFK that's in People Work. I, I don't want to misquote it, but you know, a <laughs> glass of wine or two. But it's you know, effort and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. And there's a lot of people that are willing to wake up every day and work hard. There's a lot of people that love that what you know what they do and have the courage to be successful. 
but they don't put it back to purpose. But think about this, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. we, we share the greater purpose with Krista and Julie and Mike and Vlad and, and the growing team at Curator. And now all of a sudden, you know, that purpose we have at the top of the company should be so big. And that's the, my biggest takeaway from meeting with Gary personally one time was that you have to think so much bigger than you're thinking. But once you get them bought in on that, Jimmy, mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously also way bigger than what they were thinking. Most people want to have a comfortable life with incremental raises and to be patted on the back. But when you as the leader can go to your tribe and go to your troops and say, we're going to freaking change the world. And when we do that, here's our definition of success as a company from a financial and an emotional perspective. And if you're pumped about working hard for that every day, now go log into WordPress and clean that shit up a little bit. You know, you see what I'm saying? The, it, the, you know, it's, it's different. It really is. And, uh, you know, just awesome stuff, Jay. So but besides the one thing.com, did you have one other thing there, Jimmy? Yeah, I, this, and we'll, we'll, we'll do the plug here. Just I have one last question for you, Jake. Yeah. I definitely didn't want to forget this because I think right now, in uh, this is true for us as a young company going now into our, our we're going to hit our two year anniversary in December. Um, and, uh, and it's true for uh, companies that have been around for a long time. We, we tend to look at established companies. We look at Salesforce and HubSpot, seven year old companies, you know, billion dollar market caps, and say, you know, the technology is great, the people are great, the structure is great, they get everything kind of put together. This is now really true for anyone in the internet age or digital age because it's all right there in our face, right? So, so this can create this, I, I think, effect where you feel like you're way behind the curve and you'll never catch up. But there's one kind of underlying tone in the book and, and, and from interviews I've heard you speak on, which is this idea of kind of gratitude and positivity, right? Because no matter where you're at, you seem those those sort of fundamental beliefs are sort of at the core of what you're doing. And I just wanted you just to touch on that because as you're going through hell, you got to kind of have that sort of you know mindset. I think to be able to sort of to reap those rewards. You know, I think a lot of people have a misconception because of the internet and what we read that all the success happened overnight. And I was like talking to some guys about a company that's launching here and they've only been established for like a year and a half and they're looking at this huge fundraising. And I asked the question, how long was the guy writing the code? He goes, oh, he's been working on this for eight years. And that is so much more typical. I ran into a lady at one of our teaching things and she just got her organic food distributed by Whole Foods. And I said, that's awesome. How long have you been around? She goes, three and a half years. And I go, God, that's fast. And she goes, thank you. Everyone thinks I'm slow. I'm like, no, if you look at great companies, it can take eight to 10 years for them to really catch on. And so we have this misconception and we think we're failing. So the first lesson is everybody goes through that, right? You're two years into you know, your foundation laying period. What you lay down here for the next three or four years becomes that platform for the massive jump. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is every failure is a lesson if you learn from it. And I just know people who are just like, you know, they're grateful. Okay. We survived that one. You know, it didn't kill us. And they baseball. You know, they forget that they lasted three times and then they hit a home run. An entrepreneur has got to take that attitude because failure comes with it. Success is just messy. Mm -hmm. It's messy. And if you believe that myth, you'll think you're just a mutant. Yeah. And people <laughs> walk around and they get tearful. They're like, really? Y'all mess up all the time too? I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, you look at Gary's floor, it's littered with papers and books. I mean, he's a madman some days. Yeah. That, but that's, that's what success looks like. That, that's going to be the, your next book, guys, is, is, is Success is Messy, because I actually think that's, it's, it's packaged to us in a much different way, and I think the reality is you look at Sue Adler and the Ben Kinney's and the Lisa Archers of the world, and, you know, where they're at today and where they were five years ago, right, it wasn't, it wasn't a sort of straight hockey stick curve. So, uh, Chris, let's close it out. We want to let Jay, Jay Romy get a couple places to plug, but... Uh, Jay, uh, where can people connect with you online besides the one thing.com? Um, the great thing about my name, Jay Papazan, is that if you Google it, you find all of my social media. So I'm pretty active on Facebook. Um, I'm semi active on Twitter. I know enough to monitor it. And uh, my secret, secret, you know, guilty pleasure is Instagram. So those would be the three places you're most likely. And I'll just, I respond to everyone. If someone's got a question, I'll respond straight to the question or even get on the phone with them. So I love it. I love people wanting to know more about the books. 
And and by the way, guys, if you're on Twitter right now, we have a really big audience on Twitter now, Jay. Make sure you hop in there. Uh, look okay. up the ha the hashtag water cooler. You'll see hundreds of mentions of your uh, of the interview tonight. But awesome. His Twitter handle, you guys, to thank him for being on the show is at J Papasan. Like you said, P A P A S A N. Mm -hmm. I had to type it like 500 times this week in all the promos. So I, <laughs> I got it. And uh, if you go to the one thing.com, the number one slash water cooler, there's a special promo code. You get the one thing for 15 bucks. You get free shipping. And if you email me your receipt, chris at curator.com, you're also going to get a free hard copy of People Work thanks to our friends over at Zerple. So pretty awesome, awesome. awesome deal. And you know, the book again, Jay, congrats on the success. I'm excited. Uh, I don't want to say what you said before about the book you're working on now. I don't know if people know that that's what you're working on now. Um, it's okay. We're updating the Millionaire Real Estate Agent. Um, that book has got actually, it's been a lot slower to get there, but it's in terms of velocity, but it's actually sold 850,000 copies. Yeah, I was going to wonder. I was you're wondering making Chris get more and more depressed, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that but there was a, probably a book before that, right? So you know you couldn't get a publisher for a year, dude. If that makes you feel better, nobody would even publish us for a year. Yeah. Well, the funny and that's what I love about your success, and that's what it comes down to, Jimmy, is that if it, you can either let life pass you by, or you can take the bull by the horns and run with it and focus on things that matter the most. The dot loop we call it, you know, focusing on the few things that matter most. The book is called The One Thing. Congrats on all your success, Jay. We appreciate you being on. Great stuff, Love Jay. Thanks a lot, guys. Take, Take care, Jay. Take care, Jay. All right, Jimmy, cool. Good stuff. Let's get into last call. Last call. Do you have any anything to recap or no? Well, you know, I, I wrote one thing down here, and uh, okay. this is my last thing for, for Pillow Talk. I'll keep it really short. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is the you know we hear Chris at the topic of the power of saying no, right? We've, it's been brought up a couple of times. It's kind of a common theme, but he he kind of phrased it in a way that really resonated with me, which is he said, you know, know why you're saying yes, and it makes it a lot easier to say no, right? And dive into why you're saying yes to the things that you're already saying yes to, and you'll yeah. quickly uncover, you know, what are the things that are basically irrelevant or outside your why, outside your one thing, whatever it is. Know why you're saying yes, and it makes it a lot easier to say no. Uh, yeah, and also when you Gary, I, I wish I had the document, Jimmy. I keep it somewhere in my office here. It's pretty close. But when I met with Gary Keller, he had a, a picture in his office of Disney had done in 1957. So if you go to Google and you put in Walt Disney 1957, and it'll pull up a drawing in Google Images. And when Gary talks about think bigger, and and when Jay talks about you know. Think like here's the trajectory you want. So mm -hmm. figure out where that high point is and work backwards on how you need to get there. That's that was my takeaway. And what I did, and I think what people should do for their life and for their business is look at that drawing of Walt Disney and look at how all the pieces are actually complementing each other. Jimmy, we had a conversation today. Sometimes I get a chance to to pick up really cool speaking opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. But we know that that's a direct pipe back to what we're doing at Curator, you know? So like once you know, like here's the big vision and here's the goal as a company. So if your goal as a company is to be worth 50 million or $100 million, then it makes those conversations about things that make you a few thousand dollars really quick, like the one we had today, right? Mm -hmm. It was yeah. like, well, you know, our goal's X and your idea is Y and Y doesn't get us to X. so get the fuck back to work. That's kind of the idea here, you know? So anyway, it, it's good stuff. So let's get into last call. Great interview, Jimmy. Have you ever had a chance to hang with Jay? I mean, what'd you think? Impressive guy, right? Yeah, you know, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't say I'm surprised because obviously to get to his level, you got to be a sharp guy. Um, but, you know, th these, these are these are obvious ideas that are really hard to execute, and he was able to sort of frame them in an actionable way for for at least for me and for the audience, I think. So, um, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's, you know, and I have to, I feel bad at making this after the air. I, I, I haven't read the one thing. I'm going to read it, you know, uh, but I looked at some of the notes you shared with me today. But, you know, I get the idea. It makes sense, you know. And uh, yeah. I, think, I, I think we're, I think you touched on the very beginning of the interview, Chris, which is he sort of framed it like, I don't know this is a new problem, 
but it's certainly a problem that's flared up, right? Distraction, time management, work-life balance. This is an issue that kind of is, is, is at a fever pitch right now because of people like you and me who are telling them to download. You mentioned like 20 apps are an interview. So people are sort of out there scrambling, downloading them. So cool. All right, last but call. One, one other quick takeaway as we get into last call. Last call is tr trending technology advice, trending mobile apps, trending stories in the real estate industry. But what... What other takeaway, Jimmy? Excuse me, I'm getting the hiccups from the wine. <laughs> it's like a third week in a row you get hiccups. One, one other takeaway here yes. is that even if you're really freaking smart, it's always a good strategy to, atta to attach yourself to people that are smarter, okay? And, and, and I don't mean to, to disrespect Jay in any sense. Like intellectually on a lot of levels, he may be smarter than Gary Keller. And like, if you look at my situation, like I look at Austin, the success that he's achieved at the age that he's achieved it, like you mentioned, Jay and Austin and Gary, they're way more successful than us. But I think in real estate, Jimmy, we have a tendency to want to be that big, you know, in the room, right? You, you, you don't have room. Like you're just trying to be the one, right? Kind of back to the one thing. You're trying to be that one guy. And humility goes a long way, like understanding that like I'm a pretty sharp guy, but if I don't work with you, it, you know, there's like a couple things you're smarter at than me, right? You know, there's a lot of things Jay's smarter at than Gary, but, there, but also having just the humility as a really sharp person to say, who is somebody that's even 10 times more successful than I am and how can I work with them? That's something that a lot of people, I think, are, are sleeping on. You know, it's like there's always people more successful than you. How can you build a relationship and work with them? You know, Jay Papazon working with Gary Keller, you know, and being a part of Mega Camp and doing those things. I mean, he's reaching, you know, again, rare air, Jimmy. You know, mm -hmm. me getting a chance to work with Austin and be a part of what Dot Loop's doing and write the book with him and stuff like that, it, 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 it's propelled me. So anyway... You know, being Pippin is underrated. I'm cool being Pippin. You know, Pippin wins championships. Pippin's top 50 NBA all time. Pippin made a shitload of money too, right? So I'm just there's a there's people out there <laughs> listening that they're not that they're afraid to be a co-author. Does that, that make sense? They're afraid to be a co-founder. You know, there's one. There's, I, I agree with everything you just said there, uh, and I think it's the uh, the uh, Lean Startup actually put this in, in another way, Chris, which is you're not Steve Jobs. Right. Yeah. And I think I think that's a, that's a tough thing for people to swallow who have an ego, which is, you know, very rarely in life are we so intelligent, so motivated, so driven that we can be an egomaniac and 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 be able to sort of achieve a level of success. And I think the reality is, I think the Steve Jobs that people understand or 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 uh, uh, get written about or talked about really isn't the true Steve Jobs because he was a very collaborative person. So you're not Steve Jobs. I'm not Steve Jobs. Let's try to build something amazing together. That's kind All of right, cool. Let's yeah. last call. All right, last call. We'll fly through it. So the first one, I'm going to tweet it out now. This is really cool, Jimmy. I think this is super relevant for realtors because realtors, uh, and here we go. Thank you to my man, Mark Corbett. I'm going to tweet it out right now, but it's Walt Disney's mind map. I just tweeted that out. People look for the hashtag water cooler. Um, awesome stuff. So this first thing I just tweeted for last call is called Rebump App. Okay, Jimmy? And yeah. I want you to go to their website real quick. It's Rebump dot cc which I thought was kind of hot uh, honestly but rebump dot cc and if you scroll down a little bit on the site what you'll see is they show the life of an email and what and and they're talking really about follow-up emails you know what I'm saying so like and we get this we run a digital marketing company that sends follow-up emails for tons of people every single day and so the idea is that email number one you know plus number two plus number three and four that can sometimes get a hundred percent response. So Jimmy, rebump.cc, mm -hmm. what this does is think of this as like when you're doing one-to-one -one email, okay? So what they've shown is that like once you've like laser identified like, okay, I'm going to email this lead, the typical response rate is 10%. What they do is they send a series of bumps. Think of bumps as automated additional emails if the first email doesn't get opened or replied to. Does that make sense? So email one goes out, 
If it doesn't get open or replied, email bump one, bump two. And what they're showing is that after four bumps, you can achieve a hundred percent response rate. Mm -hmm. And it, and 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 this is, you know, a new concept I think, right? Which is like you identify that a lead's hot through yeah. automated email marketing, and then you go into sending them one-off emails in an attempt to get an appointment. So these bumps, you go in and you set them up, and then basically they just happen automatically at certain intervals. Now, Every would you email. move people like an action plan or like a, some type of marketing automation? Would you move people from, like, let's say, bump series number one to bump series number two? So if they replied based on their reply, right, there's going to be a sort of a fork in the road, positive, negative, neutral. No, that's what I love about this. The, the whole purpose of every campaign and rebump is just to get the person to reply to your email. You know what I mean? So yeah. you're not moving them into campaigns. Your, your success is based on getting them to respond. Okay. So it's cool stuff, rebump.cc. Cool. It's a, it's a, a golden you better, not, you better not be rebumping me. I would be really upset if I find out all of a sudden. It's like, <laughs> oh, no, no uh, but think about this, Jimmy. Think about this, right? So, yeah. like, you send me an email that says, hey, Chris, I need to get uh, this copy signed off on by 5 p.m. today. So you could send that, and then, like, you could set it to where at 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock it sent me two more emails if I didn't reply. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool stuff, dude. If you actually wrap your head around it, it's really really neat stuff. So rebump.cc. Rebump.cc. Yeah, next one. This is a cool one. This is kind of in honor of the one thing. This mm -hmm. is a new mobile app called Bond. B O N D. And it's very simple. It, the interface. You go to getbond.co. That's where you go. I just tweeted it out. Getbond.co. And what that app does, Jimmy, is it's, it's very simple, uh, very similar to what we're trying to do with, you know, the simplicity of what we're building right now. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's the same concept. All it does is it basically tells you, uh, A, how do you want to follow up with this person? The only options are phone, text, or Facebook message. Yeah. B, how frequently? So that's it. So, like, the concept is, who do you want to build bonds with? And so like I, I went in there and it was like, okay, I want to make sure I call Ben Kenny four times a year. That, that was kind of the bond that I set up. You like that? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at the website right now. I, I, yeah. think, the, I think the idea, Chris, and this is where um, – this is where I think we're going to evolve as an industry in the marketing world is marketing automation was sort of the first step to help us follow up at scale. But what you're describing here with Vaughn is this idea of a combination between humans and automation, right? Personalizing a human intervention to basically say this is exactly what I want to happen based on the knowledge I have about my relationship with this person. Because I'll tell you right now, software will never get to the point where they'll understand you know, the human relationship because there's just too many complexities. So I love the idea of the marriage between those two those two sort of uh, realities. So uh, getbond.co, that's the domain? Getbond.co, and yeah. think of it like, and, and what's cool is you can even use it for clients in process where it's like, remind me to text message this person once a week for the next five weeks or something. It's really cool stuff, Jimmy. I liked it. Um, All right, let's keep rolling. Yeah, next one. Next one. This one's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so RPR. Do you know what that is, Jimmy, or no? Yeah, that was it. Real estate property resources. They did. I, I, I'm well, baffled by what they do. Or the realtors property resources. Realtors property resource. And 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 the high level concept a few years back, and they've dumped tons of you know tens of millions of dollars into this now. Yeah. And props to our buddy Reggie Nicolay, Nicole Nicolay's husband, who works on this, but. RPR Mobile, which is where I think this really becomes useful. Think of it like this, Jimmy. Think about the Zillow app, the Realtor.com app, uh, the, the Trulia app. Think about creating one of those that had even more and better and kind of, you know, proprietary data that was only practitioner facing, right? And mm -hmm. then the practitioner could use that app to create reports and to send alerts and stuff like that. So anyway, long story short, RPR is now on the iPhone and Android store. 
you can go to blog.narrpr.com. NARRPR.com. And Jimmy, let me just say this. Like, I wasn't sold on this because the the sentiment about RPR has been negative more than positive. Yeah. But when I saw the sentiment from the agents in our group, and uh -huh. these are, you know, tech savvy agents, agents that are the same ones that have kind of bitched about RPR. Yeah. Their response, their genuine response, and I kind of even almost steered them because I said, it looks like RPR released an iPhone and Android app. Anyone excited by this? I was almost steering like a lawyer because I know people are generally not excited by RPR stuff. <laughs> well, Jimmy, they were excited. The post has, you know, 40 likes, 40 comments, 95% mm -hmm. positive sentiment. So I would think, you know, let's listen to the people here. If you're, you know, listening, download the RPR mobile app, see how useful it is based on your area. I know each MLS provides a little different info. But, Jimmy, these groups, like 40 likes or 40 comments is, is really off the charts. So good job, you know, Reggie, Nicole, and the rest of the group. RPR is on the iPhone and the Android. Yeah, and we'd, and we'd love to hear some practical applications for the people who are, who are listening right now on Twitter. Share with us, you know, how you're using it for your business because uh, I think it's something I always look for is, okay, it's a nice app. It has some great data. What's the practical application? Um, cool. So last thing I got, Chris, and, we'll, and I'll let you wrap it up and talk about next week's guest and the week after. Well, the, the practical application, just really quickly, Jimmy, you asked. Okay. It's so like... There's an, there's an audience ask, but yeah, you can tell me what it is. Okay. Well, I think the practical application is like, Hey, the Zillow app and the Trulia app are really great, yeah. but the, the data that they use is really shitty. I mean, that's what I would say. I mean, you don't have to say shitty. You can say it's really inaccurate. But there's this app that we get, you know, believe it or not, as licensed agents that gives us this additional, like, accurate data feed. Here it is. And if it looks great, <coughs> people will believe it. Design matters. The app looks great, Jimmy. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on it, and we'll, I'd love to hear the feedback. Um, so, last thing for me, Chris, is uh, this kind of talked a little bit about what Jade mentioned earlier in the show, which is kind of getting outside your comfort zone. You probably have some some places you probably can share as well. But I've been as of recently. You know, I'm not a really social guy. I'm not like uh, I'm certainly not the life of the party when I go out and like go to an event. It's I'm I'm actually particular. I'm actually kind of awkward to be honest. Um, but that being said, like I've been, I've been forcing myself because I'm in, I'm in this sort of startup community here in Boston to get out and to go to more events outside of our industry to learn ideas and meet people. And what I want to kind of encourage our audience because I've, I've I, there's been just so many amazing people I've met and businesses I've met that are just so far outside of what we do that have uh, kind of allowed me to bring some new ideas to what we do here at Curator is uh, there are sites out there. Meetup.com is a good one that I, that I've been using which has local events. It's basically everywhere, right? It's not just in cities like Boston. It's in, it's in, there's even ones in New Hampshire, and if there's in New Hampshire, it's going to be uh, everywhere at that point. Um, but you know, places for you to connect with like-minded business professionals who are starting a business, uh, marketing their business, trying to grow their business. They have the same co you know, questions and concerns and, and problems that you have. And I think that there's nothing more powerful, Chris, than for an agent and a team leader to get outside of the echo chamber that we live with in real estate and get out there and connect with people who are sort of in the same boat, different industries, different products and services. But again, I think it's a lot of inspiration there. So meetup.com, I don't know if you have anyone, anything you want to add to that, Chris, but I, I'm a big fan of this, this idea. Yeah, I love it. I won't add anything to it. Let's get into the last one and then talk a little bit about next week. We've yep. got a special edition of the water cooler coming up next week for a good cause, by the way. The last thing I wanted to plug here, Jimmy, just really quickly, mm -hmm. is 1,000 Watt. You know, they're friends of ours. They've been on the show. And they just released their new site. And, you know, we're redesigning our site, Jimmy, and we're constantly uh, looking at, you know, our client sites and making those better and stuff. And if, if there's one thing that 1,000 Watt just absolutely crushes is, is really, you know, helping people understand who they are as a brand, you know, and I, I want everybody to go and check out thousandwatt.net. And it's not even so much that like they do have the, one of the best blogs in real estate, 
So I would recommend going to the blog, subscribing to the blog. But like even just the design of their site, Jimmy, you know, big ideas for real estate. We help companies strengthen their brands, <coughs> improve their marketing, and out innovate their competitors. Right? Mm -hmm. Like to me, that is so cool. And then just the way they showcase their collection of work and some of the case studies that they highlight, you know, they've got a really cool thing called the thousand watt index. But you know, one, one of the things that I've noticed in the real estate technology space is that a lot of the companies don't lead by example. They sell websites, their website's ugly. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they give webinars about Twitter, they don't even tweet. You know what I'm saying? They talk about brand and they've never helped anyone build one and they've never come up with one. So in, in a world of frauds, 1,000 watts legit, 1,000watt.net. Subscribe to their blog, but more importantly, just take in the essence of their brand. You know, experience, like, if you were to reach out to them to hire them, how much do you think that they cost? I think they cost a lot, Jimmy, looking at their site. So, you know, I want real estate agents to have the same swagger as the guys at Thousand Watt when it comes to their digital presence. Anyway, next week, I'll close it out, Jimmy. I see you're coughing there. Yeah, it's all good. There was a tragedy a couple weeks ago, I think about a week and a half ago. Beverly Carter was a real estate agent in Arkansas that was murdered. Bless you, Jimmy Sneezing, for those of you that are uh, watching. And we actually had a lot of people and a lot of discussions in the group about doing an episode of the water cooler on realtor safety. And the, the, what was funny was like in the groups, Jimmy, I thought what was fascinating was like, uh, you know, we love technology, right? Boom, we're all, we're all about it. But at the same time, we didn't realize how important technology potentially is to solving the realtor safety problem, which obviously exists and was highlighted by the Beverly Carter incident. So, you know, whether it was jewelry that, that has, you know, things that can send signals like jewelry where people wouldn't know that it's monitoring you, but it is, mm -hmm. you know, apps, a lot of people, Jimmy, are talking about guns. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that was the most interesting thread in in the last year. Was hey, Chris and Jimmy, love all this tech, but maybe what we should spend our money on is a gun. And you know, we try not to take sides on that stuff, but what we've done is we're bringing on what we believe to be two passionate and opinionated experts. So next Wednesday. Uh, not is it next Wednesday? Yeah, next Wednesday, yep. the twenty second. Yep. Instead of airing the show at night and drinking, you know, barefoot wine while I do it, we're gonna do a daytime show out of respect, obviously, to the to the topic. We're gonna probably air Jimmy for about thirty minutes from one to one thirty. We'll do a daytime episode. We're bringing on Adam Contos, who works for Remax LLC. But he put out a realtor safety course, Jimmy, in 03, 04. And the reason he put that out is he is a former SWAT team commander. Mm -hmm. So anybody that's seen any movies with SWAT teams and kind of the situations they encounter, I yeah. mean, he, he, he's a, a professionally trained, we won't, we won't call him an assassin. That would be the wrong <laughs> word. But you know, I, I believe that he is going yeah. to educate people about self-defense and about strategy and understanding your surroundings and you know doing those things I don't know you know fighting the hand whatever it is Jimmy yeah you know, I, I believe Adam's gonna bring a lot of tactical advice and then we're also bringing on Lee Brown okay Lee Brown who's been on the show before she's a firecracker I believe she ran for political office in North Carolina as a Republican I'm not positive yeah but she put out an article on Inman, he didn't run for a Democrat position. I can tell you that. Yeah, that I was guessing. I didn't want to. I didn't want to stereotype Lee, but I was thinking she did. <laughs> <laughs> but like the idea here is like you know, as much as like you know, normally politics and guns and a lot of that stuff are off limits. I yeah. think for this discussion, there's really nothing off limits. We want to talk about any and every option that involves real estate agents legally keeping themselves safe. And whether that's technology, whether that's just, you know, a mobile app, whether that's uh, a taser, pepper spray, 
you know, or a gun, I think it's worth discussing all of the different things that kind of came up in that thread in the group. So next week, and also here's the other thing. We want to we want to use the event to also raise some money uh, for Beverly Carter's family and kind of for her foundation. Uh, and what we're going to do is, as a company, we'll start off the fund. We'll I'll set up a website by next week, mm-hmm. and we'll just raise money. You know, five bucks, ten bucks, twenty bucks, a hundred bucks, whatever it is. Yep. Curator will throw in a few hundred dollars, and we'll just in real time, Jimmy, keep checking that number throughout the show. So we'll have a little fun with it. Try to raise some money for Beverly Carter's in in her memory. Give agents some practical advice, technology and not technology. I, I mean, a gun is technology, right? You know, technology and not technology. Discuss all the options to keep agents safe. But I think it's going to be fun, Jimmy. If you're on Twitter, guys, I'm going to hop on right now. Please let me know if you're excited about the show next week because we're excited to do it. And then the week after that, Jimmy, we're going to air live from Paris. So good times right. at the water cooler. All right, guys. Have a great night. Thanks for coming on tonight. Peace.